Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Science Roundup. I'm Alicia Halliday, Chief Science Officer at the Autism Science Foundation. You may have heard about some of the studies I'm going to review, but I wanted to give you my quick perspective. First, I know that many, many parents have concerns about their child that they bring to the pediatrician just to have him or her take a quick look and say, oh, everything's fine. There hasn't been a standardized evaluation. There hasn't been any formalized screeners used. But there really hadn't been any evidence until now that these screening tools outperform clinician judgment. There's a myth that all children with autism show only atypical behaviors and that they show obvious symptoms in all settings, which would make autism very easy to identify. But that just simply isn't true. Autism is, in fact, hard to correctly identify. So isn't observation in a 10-minute well baby visit enough? This new study published in Pediatrics put this question to the test. They recruited kids who scored a positive MCHAT, which is the Modified Checklist for Autism in Toddlers. They were then given a full diagnostic workup. A 10-minute video of that longer evaluation was given to raters to determine whether or not they showed any autism behaviors in that 10-minute period of time. This 10 minutes was chosen because the normal well baby checkup takes anywhere between 10 and 20 minutes. By just observing behaviors for a 10-minute period of time, the experts viewing the short videos missed over one-third of autism cases. More importantly, the children with autism only showed atypical behaviors about 11% of the time in these short clips. These atypical behaviors included things like repetitive vocalizations, unusual, unusual examination of objects, or even things like not responding, not taking turns, and not following gestures. It took a longer, more in-depth evaluation to see some of these signs. Also, the two people looked at the video clips didn't always agree on what they considered to be atypical. This study provides evidence that in a quick evaluation, signs and symptoms of ASD aren't immediately obvious, and it underscores the need for more standardized instruments, including parent report measures, in identifying autism symptoms. When it comes to identifying signs and symptoms of autism, Sometimes more is better, and now there's science to back that up. The second study has to do with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in autism. We know that just based on their diagnostic criteria, autism and ADHD are different. Autism is characterized by atypical social interaction, communication difficulties, and some behavioral inflexibility, while ADHD is more about excessive hyperactivity, impulsivity, and inattentiveness. Yet it is common for these conditions to co-occur. ADHD is thought to be present in about 30 to up to 60% of individuals with autism. And autistic traits appear elevated in individuals with ADHD. We know that they're both highly heritable, but how? Do they co-occur because of genetic or environmental factors or both? It's important for researchers to explore why these conditions co-occur because understanding this will help the better diagnosis of each condition and better interventions. One way to better understand these factors is through twin studies, comparing twins that share 100% of their DNA and mostly 100% of their prenatal environment, and those that share only 50% of their DNA and mostly 100% of their prenatal environment. In the UK, there's a large study of twins called the Twins Early Development Study. Some have autism, some have ADHD, but more commonly, they have traits or autism or traits of ADHD without a diagnosis. These traits are measured by standardized instruments given to the twins, both identical, fraternal, same-sex, and opposite-sex eternal. The investigators looked to the degree to which there was a genetic or environmental overlap between autistic traits and traits of ADHD, not in people with the diagnosis again, but in the general population. How did they do this? They gave 4,000 twin pairs measures of ADHD and ASD and looked at where they were overlapping in those monozygotic twins, which share 100% of their DNA, and dizygotic or fraternal twins, which show 50% of their DNA. They found that communicative difficulties and traits of ADHD showed the strongest genetic overlap. Less so for repetitive behaviors and social difficulties, but it was still there. There really wasn't much in the way of overlap in traits that could be attributed to environmental factors. While there are long-term potential consequences of these findings regarding specific genes of interest, the more immediate conclusion that can be drawn is the role of different subgroups showing different symptoms as a consequence of different causes. 
Based on these findings, the way that certain people with autism show symptoms of ADHD depends on the symptom of interest, which could be guided by the cause. These findings are consistent with other research looking at overlap across symptoms in ADHD and ASD. Speaking of interventions, there seems to be a new study each week showing efficacy of parent-based interventions. Last week, we reported on one using a procedure that included sensory behaviors, and this week, out of the UK and published in the Lancet Psychiatry, one that looked at a video-based intervention to provide individualized feedback to help parents. They were kind of like a video guide to understanding your individual baby's behavior, their specific communication style, and helped parents recognize baby's intentions and in improving their attention. The study was conducted in high-risk infants from seven to 10 months of age. And while autism was not a final outcome, things that are early risk markers for autism were. This includes attentiveness and affect in the infant. The effects were positive, but stronger in some areas than others. And the intervention was not effective in all areas. There was a positive outcome, but it should not be taken as a one-size-fits-all approach that definitely prevents autism. This type of intervention has not been shown to be sufficient to improve longer-term outcome, like an autism diagnosis, and it may not always be appropriate depending on the family involved. The study is encouraging, and as I mentioned last week with Amy Weatherby's study and Grace Baranek's study from University of North Carolina, for children younger than two years of age, it's crucial to provide the right resources to parents, and the only way to show that it's beneficial is through this randomized clinical trial design. An excellent summary by ASF SAB member Kathy Lord can be found on our Facebook site and our Twitter feeds. Finally, last but not least, a study that addresses the role in vitamin D in autism risk. You might remember before the holidays, a story came out that reported some alterations of symptoms with vitamin D supplementation in a child with autism in China. However, until very recently, there's been very little data on whether or not people with autism actually have low vitamin D levels and what causes it. So recommending vitamin D supplementation was not entirely substantiated or corroborated with any scientific justification. In the past few months, though, a series of studies have been published that show that people with autism have a very slight but significant reduction in a metabolite of vitamin D. The most recent have been found in Scandinavian countries like Denmark and Sweden. Since vitamin D levels are mainly controlled by diet and sunlight exposure, it isn't clear which of these is responsible for the reduction in individuals with autism. Since the effect is not huge, it isn't known if there's a particular group of individuals with a certain subtype that are more affected, or if there's a specific genetic mutation that interacts with vitamin D that leads to a diagnosis. There have been some studies that link vitamin D to immune function, but not in autism specifically. This might be an interesting avenue to follow. Also, a study using the National Health and Nutrition Examination Study showed that almost one-third of the population is at risk for or has a vitamin D insufficiency. So vitamin D is certainly something to watch out for because it's clear not all of us are getting enough of it. Thank you all for listening, and I look forward to talking to you again next week. If you have not already, please put April 22nd on your calendar for the ASF Day of Learning and the Evening of Celebration. Talk to you next week.